Iron Man with us today, which we're really excited about, a real Iron Man. <laughs> and this guest story is not often told, actually, and you know us, we love a good story. Now, our guest today went from farmer to Hollywood trainer after making the decision to move from Wales to LA to pursue his passion. And since then, he's been absolutely unstoppable in his passion, which is fitness, which he admits that he lives and breathes fitness. Now, our guest today has a very strong work ethic and that was inbred in him from working on the farm and this has served him well in his thriving career in the fitness industry. He is the creator of the Dramatic Transformation Principle, DTP, which, by the way, has had over 93 million people use it. He has his own line of gyms. He's the head spokes model for bodybuilding.com. And he has his own supplement line, which is Caged Muscle. And he's written no less than six books. I'm struggling with the first one. Um, now, he's also just completed a half Ironman in two hours less than his predicted time. And he's two months off a full Ironman. So, guys, please welcome our guest today, businessman, transformation specialist, and much more, Chris Geffen. Welcome, Chris. Awesome. Thank you very much. That's an awesome welcome. Not much pressure now to live up to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we like to, you know, sort of build people up and give them that kind of, uh, you know, what they deserve, basically. But the thing is, we hear you thrive on pressure. Yeah. You like to push yourself. Yeah, there you go. Well, can we just, I want to take that snippet and I want that as an introduction to every video that I do from now on. No problems, easy. <laughs> no problems at all. So, um, Chris, first of all, we love a good story and that's the reason why we, you know, sort of started the podcast, really. And I know we've been chatting for a while now. I think it's been like four years, actually, we first met and that was on Twitter, wasn't it? Um yeah. Yeah. And so what we want to know is, we want to know your story, how you managed to come from a little town in Wales to this world-renowned fitness expert who specialises in body transformations and, and, you know, dealing with your own mental health as well. Um, it's through trial and error to begin with. When I was in Wales, I'd had many, many jobs, yeah. whether that was like um, a a grounds person, a builder's labourer, I worked at a wood, wood furniture warehouse, worked as a panel beater, a driver, a doorman, a barman, a lifeguard. And, uh, you know, I went to college for a little while to study precision engineering, but nothing really tickled my fancy. I wasn't, I was doing things because I had to, not because I wanted to. And um, I kind of lost my way after I retired from uh, racing motocross. And that was my adrenaline fix, and I enjoyed that. I needed that endorphin rush. And um, I'd, from motocross, I had quite a bad uh, cumulative back injury. You know, if you look at an x-ray of my back, it's severely uh, good. And um, it wasn't until I actually started rehabbing that through weight training that I was alleviated from the pain that I had there. And uh, I enjoyed the feeling that I got from weight training, it would become like my double-A battery that I missed from racing motocross. And with that alleviation of pain and a release of endorphins, and that starting to look better, starting to get some sort of relief from my asthma that was holding me back. And, uh, you know, I, I was suffering a little bit from depression because, I, you know, I, I didn't have any outlet, nothing to focus on. That become something that I was passionate about. Uh, I, I noticed as I was reading more about, it could be the, the anatomy, physiology, the kinet, kinesiology of the body, but it could have been bodybuilding, looking into bodybuilding. I found that I was able to retain that content, which other stuff throughout school, and because I wasn't able to retain anything, I hated it, I couldn't stand it. I felt there was no logical reason why I needed to learn that stuff. So that was something that uh, sparked a light within me. So I went to college for several years and studied international health and sports therapy. I was very, very, very lucky that my town back then hosted one of the very best from Newcastle, from Swansea, that would stay in my town and study and you know, go to this uh, college 
for that course uh, specifically. And that course finished uh, just two years after I left college, so I was very, very lucky. Mm-hmm. And um, then I decided that I wanted to move away from Wales because I got into the habit of uh, hanging around the wrong people. I, had, I was in the habit of uh, you know, doing, you know, alcohol, drinking a lot of alcohol, partying a lot. And, uh, you know, that's when the rape scene had come on <laughs> pretty big, and I was a part of that. Uh, so I decided I had to separate myself from that social network. So in doing so, I went and uh, applied for work on cruise liners. So I had to go down to London, to Stanford, stay there for about eight weeks to learn about marine life and the products that we were suggesting and different treatments because now I have to start doing things like iron even though I had experience and qualifications in phoratic treatments. But further from that, things like facials and mud rat, mud, mud rat treatments and residual treatments. But to learn all about that, uh, which then took me onto the cruise liners. And uh, it turned out to be a bigger party than what Wales was. So after eight months of that, I decided to try my hand in Australia because I met a girl on the cruise liners from Australia. And uh, we talked about, well, we'll try and do something there. So within two days of being in Australia, I managed to get a job in a gym uh, called Bodyline in North Sydney. And uh, then whilst I was there, I decided, uh, you know what, I'd like to see if I can set up my own personal training business. So as part of my cardio in the morning, I'd have like several hundred leaflets that I would just put through people's letterboxes in more expensive residential areas in Sydney. And uh, I got uh, quite a good clientele base there. So I bought myself one of those total trainers that you'd teach yeah. and honest advertise on TV. Had uh, some boxing mitts and pads and rope and kettlebell. I'd throw it all in the trunk of the car and I'd go and train these people, whether it be on Balmoral Beach, Manly Beach, or right up Mrs. Macquarie's chair, which is right opposite the, the Harbour Bridge there. So I had a beautiful shop window front. And uh, then, you know, I decided, wow, I'm doing okay here. Let me purchase a gym. So I then purchased a gym. And that was uh, probably a mistake because now I had more overheads. Yeah. And uh, during that time, I decided I want to reach out to more people as opposed to just the one-on-one transformations that I was focusing on. Uh, so I then uh, taught myself how to write through uh, several Miriam Webster's books on uh, journalism and grammatical writing and started submitting articles to magazines until they started to stick. And uh, through getting articles published, I managed to get myself a contract with Weeder Publications as a writer to begin with in LA. And then I taught myself photography, got myself a 40D Canon so I could better sell my articles because now I had images of athletes and bodybuilders to accompany them. And uh, it, it kind of, that's what kind of basically took me to LA uh, initially. This whole time, I'm personal training still to support myself. And I'm competing in natural bodybuilding shows. Uh, so I start. I started that in Wales, like literally the week before I went to, down to Stansted to, um, you know, before going on to the cruise liners. Uh, but I didn't really know what I was doing. I'm not saying that I do know what I'm doing now. But I competed <laughs> in a show that wasn't tested, even though I was a natural athlete. Uh, I had no idea there was such a thing as tested and untested shows. But I managed to get third. I was happy with that. I was by far the smallest, but very, very lean. So I went zero carbs for like eight weeks. Oh, my <laughs> and, God. Um, yeah, it was tough. It was tough. I was. I remember I would drive past my turning to my home and keep driving, and I'd accept money from the out of <laughs> somewhere else. And, you know, find them the kettle in the fridge. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I enjoyed the competitive nature of shows. Uh, I hated the process of posing, tanning, and uh, all that sort of stuff. But I enjoyed having the accountability and having a goal to focus on. Unfortunately, I had to deal with the post-show blues. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, I really, really didn't like. And, you know, I thought maybe it's because I keep getting second. But I, when I won a show and I felt no difference, I thought, okay, maybe this is something I need to question. But uh, that, that's the short story to L.A. 
I'll tell you what, Chris, I've got to say, it's like you telling my story. Because I've done the motocross, I've done the bodybuilding, I've started off in the gym doing the personal training. And I thought I was going to love the personal training, but it, it just didn't fulfill me like the other sports I've done, like the motocross. The motocross is in my blood. And I think all motocrosses, it's in your blood. And that was only injury that stopped me from doing that. But the bodybuilding, is, it's a weird sport, isn't it? It is weird. You know, I, I do love to train. Yeah. Training is my necessity. I love that therapeutic feeling from training. Um, but some people absolutely love bodybuilding. They'll do it for years and years and years. Like looking at Dexter Jackson. Uh, but, you know, it's the actual and, and the accountability and have the goal set. And I encourage many newcomers uh, to focus on a show just so they have that accountability because when you're up there in you know, nothing more than underwear, um, you know, there's nowhere for you to hide. So if anything's going to push you, it's going to be yeah, something like that. Totally. If, you know, vanity and, uh, you know, building up a muscular sculpted physique as you go. So um, you said that after the show you had this post-show blues and, you know, you would think after a show... And we've done it before, you know, when you get off stage, you're pumped, it's like, yeah, all this, but, and you think that you would be the most happiest because you're in the, the best shape of your life. Tell us a little bit more about that and how it yeah, was for you. Yeah, I think you. it was, you know, you are so focused on the actual elements of the event, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's a lot of pressure to show up in shape. You know how fast your condition can disappear. Mm -hmm. Literally, I've seen it disappear on me in like four or five hours nervousness, cortisol levels, and you know, then all of a sudden you've got this subcutaneous layer that makes you look like you're eight weeks out. Um, and you know, when you're focused on getting to bed by 9.30, having your meals at a certain time, making sure that you put everything into your training session, you have all your pills and supplements laid out for when you're traveling, and then when all that discipline and schedule comes to an abrupt end, it's like you now fall into the abyss. You know, if you haven't got a goal set up to take you specifically from the B point to now C, uh, that's where you can really lose your way. And, you know, I still deal with it now, but not as bad. You know, I just did that half, man, half Iron Man. So I'm dealing with it a little bit this week. And uh, thankfully, I've got a full Iron Man coming up, up now in uh, two months' time. But, you know, I need to start preparing right now to make sure that I don't fall too deep after that event. I have got an extremely busy schedule coming up. Whether that will uh, help or not, we'll soon find out. But um, no, I, I have noticed it with a few people. Uh, but it is, it is very hard to deal with. I just find that being busy is best. Yeah. Um, not overly busy, but you know, I, I always say if I think too much, it makes me think too much. Yeah. So I really try to eradicate any possibility of more time and more thoughts. Yeah, and I, you know, we just were talking beforehand about you know you preparing and how that settles your mind as well when it comes to this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, being prepared in advance. So, you know, like after one of my video trainers, I decided, okay, I'm going to, before I finish, I'm going to focus on going vegetarian for six weeks, and that will take me to my next bridging point where I'll focus on something like that. Um, you know, a lot of people will focus on feeding themselves as their reward. But, you know, if you've only got your appearance to keep you happy and now that starts uh, to falter and fall very quickly after all the hard work you've done, you know, because now you've got this layer of fluid and then within about 10 days it starts to turn the fat, you get even more depressed and then with that dep depression becomes more emotional eating and it's just a vicious circle. Yeah, definitely. I mean, your work ethic, you know, from listening to what you did about, you know, sort of using the cardio and putting the leaflets through the door and then, you know, actually submitting articles to um, magazines and everything. Do you think it was just hard work that's got you to where you've got to? Or was it partly right place, right time? You know, how do you see it? <laughs> It's probably right place, right time uh, in regards to publications still doing okay at that point. Um, you know, this is uh, got 2002, 2003, 
So publications were still doing okay, so I had a better opportunity of actually getting in there and getting paid. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, of course, there's a lot of writers around, but it was definitely persistence and consistency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was submitting article after article after article. Every week, I would be submitting them to Flex Magazine, Body Magazine, Muscle and Strength, Muscle and, uh, Muscle and Fitness, uh, you know, the Beef Magazine in the UK with uh, Alex Mack. And uh, I just kept submitting them until they would even start to stick. And when, you know, because I thought, well, I'm either going to piss them off, uh, and maybe then they will just say, okay, let's just publish this guy. Or I, eventually I'll teach myself to write uh, and distinguish myself enough that I'll get noticed. So I looked at Peter McGough's content and I would read a lot of stuff by Jeremy Clarkson in you know, his books and his uh, newspapers. And I noticed that I enjoy those pieces, much like watching him talk here. I don't have a huge interest in cars, but because it's humorous, it would allow me to attach myself to that particular person with loyalty. So I thought, well, let me put some humor into my content and uh, see if that works. And that seemed to stick and distinguish myself a little bit more. Because we tend to find, you know, with anything we do, you'll get people who will do something for a week and they won't see any results, so then they'll just stop. Um, and you see that a lot, definitely, within the um, fitness world. And it's that kind of attitude that you got there which has carried you forwards. And it's that kind of attitude which will help you to transform your body, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the a, that's a way that you've got to think, I think, with a lot of things, not just with in your body and your body transformation. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of applications that you can take from your fitness lifestyle with the discipline, with the consistency that you can put into so many other aspects of your life that will allow you to achieve whatever that goal may be. And that's why I like bodybuilding and that's why I like having my pencil foot in the gym because it allows me to transfer that energy and that discipline and that thought process of, you know, sometimes doing things when it's painful, when you don't want to do it, you still have to persist and uh, eventually it will come back to you in a reward. A lot of our guys who we deal with, they say, I haven't got time to train, I haven't got time to prep, and we know you're a really busy man with loads and loads of sort of stuff you're doing. What does the average day in Chris Gethin's life look like? If you can just run us through a quick, an average day. Sure. Uh, so I'm normally up by about four o'clock in the morning. Uh, I will pretty much immediately get on, uh, you know, whilst my food is being prepared, I'll immediately get onto the computer. Um, I find that, you know, people say, well, maybe you shouldn't get onto the computer or play with your phone, first of all. I find I'm too anxious in the gym knowing that I've had a stack of emails come through to me yeah. overnight. So I like to offload, at least get, you know, read the most important emails and get that done. And then uh, I'll, head, I'll head to the gym and be in the gym filming right now uh, by 6 a.m. And that's my weights workouts. Workouts never take me more than an hour, and then I go straight into one of my disciplines, which is either my swim by run this morning, it was a swim, uh, by about 7.15, and that's normally about it. Then by the time I'm out, I try to get in a little bit of vitamin D, especially as the weather's so beautiful here, and just then I'm away from distraction. No phone, no computer. Uh, sometimes I'll take a book out with me. Uh, uh, but you know, I try to be present as much as I can, Whenever I'm having my meals, yeah. uh, I like to you know spend some time actually being a little bit more grateful, enjoying uh, the food that I've eaten. Because you know I've been in many countries where people don't have the luxury of knowing what their next meal is and when they will get it. So I try to use that as my uh, opportunity to be grateful, you know. Mm. And then uh, by the time. It's probably about nine o'clock as uh, run around, come around. I'm back onto my computer, getting through my emails. I probably get around a hundred emails a day, so I try to get on top of them as soon as possible because I know throughout the day more emails will come in, and I'll have more conference calls to the gym this afternoon, for uh, for instance, to film for uh, my YouTube channel and for Page Muscle, and uh, you know it's it's quite boring in regards to that. I'm writing another book at the moment, uh, and I've just uh, signed a deal with Elevate Publications, so uh, I'll be publishing a book in June. 
journey as well. So sometimes uh, I'll be spending a couple of hours in the office with them discussing uh, the book and going over the chapters and all that sort of good stuff. And then later on in the afternoon, uh, it depends how I'm feeling. Because even though for this process I'm not supposed to be doing a second cardio, I'm trying to keep the time limit down by keeping the intensity there. Last night, even though this week is supposed to be a recovery week, I ended up on the walk bike in my garage. Because something built up within me and I have to let it out. So I'm not going to fall asleep. Uh, so sometimes it's better for me to overtrain instead of dealing, dealing with the mental repercussions yeah. I would possibly have from not doing that. You know? yeah. I prefer to deal with the physical aspect as opposed to dealing with the mental aspects of having that volume. And uh, then, you know, sometimes I'll be getting off my computer by about 8 p.m. I do have a treadmill. I, I've got a desk treadmill right behind the screen it. here. Uh, so a lot of the times I'll actually be on there and just move at the same time, and that really helps. Um, me to get a few more steps in and keep, like I say, you know, have my active recovery right in front of me whilst I'm on the computer. And uh, then I just try to chill out with my girlfriend by about 8 p.m. And uh, again, try to be present, eat outside. We'll always have a barbecue in this weather. So, you know, last night we had some veggie burgers and had some salad and uh, quinoa. And then, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm usually in bed. By about 9, 9.30, yeah. uh, I try to, and then I'll try to read for about at least half an hour in bed, and then it lights out. Yeah, it's important to that, have... That's when, I, that's when I'm home. Yeah. That is when I'm home. So for, in June, Ju, July, August, I think I'm away every Wednesday to Sunday from the second week of uh, uh, all, uh, July, actually July. And... Uh, I'll be away for a couple of weeks in August as well. So there's always a lot of travel there because I have to be here Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because I'm filming with the bodybuilding.com crew here, and then I'm filming myself the other four days. So I have to be here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I'm pretty much flown off somewhere else until that Sunday. But there are a couple of weeks where I have to be the entire week. And how do you manage, like, food and training and everything when you go away? That's your priority, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, that's... it's Up until now, it's been easy uh, because I'd always prioritise my, you know, my schedule. is like, you know, I, the people that organise my schedule, I'm saying, don't even think about booking me for anything until I've got my workout done in the morning and I need to have my food taken care of. So whether I go to a supermarket or not, or a lot of the time, I use these <laughs> that I'm eating all the time. So if you can see, that's Nutrition Solutions. Yeah. So on, there's a lot of food delivery companies and food prep companies that are around in different countries now. And Nutrition Solutions, the ones that I use here in the US, I think they're absolutely phenomenal because I'm not a Gordon Ramsay, but these guys are. So it doesn't feel like I'm cheating. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, but if it actually it feels like I'm cheating, but I'm not, you know, because every meal is different. Every meal tastes good. So I'll normally pack a lot of those. Some of those will be frozen. Some of them will be defrosted, and I'll put them in the fridge at the hotel. And uh, if the hotel is out of uh, fridges, I'll usually tell them, look, I'm diabetic. I need a fridge. And then I get a fridge. Nice and, uh, I just tell yeah. people I'm, I'm mad, and I get lots of things, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's how you can steal things and justify it. I'm crazy. <laughs> uh, that's, that's generally what works for me, but I know I'm faced with a huge challenge now uh, because after finishing that half, half Ironman, yeah, I was happy with my time, but I'm uh, definitely concerned as well because, you know, when I finished, I felt like I couldn't do another mile if I wanted to, but like somebody had a lasso around my legs, I literally could pick them up. So knowing that I've got to do double that in two yeah. months' time, I know that I have to pick up my weekend volume, getting uncomfortable, but getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but knowing that I'm traveling so much yeah. and having to pick up that volume, that's going to be a, a definite hard juggling act that I haven't figured out quite yet. I'm mostly going to book myself into hotels that has a spinning bike 
that has a pool. Obviously, I can run any, anywhere, it's yeah. not on a treadmill, and just get up extra early and put in a lot of hours yeah. uh, before I start my, uh, my appearances, my meetings, my travel uh, at those cities. For those that don't know, all the listeners, what's the distances you're, you're doing uh, when it comes to doing your half Ironman, and also what's it when you're doing a full Ironman? Well, the half Ironman is just the half distance of what I'll, I'm about to tell you now. So the full Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim, and then we go into a 114 mile bike ride. <laughs> Uh, and then we go into a full marathon, which is a 26-mile run. Wow. So I just completed half of that. Yeah. And, you know, that exhausted me. You know, I managed to finish that in 6 hours, 19 minutes. Crazy. Right? You know, I wanted to get in before the cutoff. Um, you know, my girlfriend, we both started at the same time. She finished at 8 hours and 9 minutes or 11 minutes. So she was a couple of hours behind, but she made the cutoff, and that was the, our goal. Yeah. So you know, I was very, very proud of her. Uh, but now, you know, uh, and up in Corner Lane, where I competed, it's in the red. So you have a scaling system of international Ironman events. And, like, the blue is the easiest, the green is the next one up, and then the red is the hardest. And, of course, I chose one of the hardest because of it's a course. very, very big course. And it, it's extremely hot. It's, like, 92 degrees it was up there, and it was supposed to get hotter in August. So these are all the things I have to take into account being a bigger person. My body core temperature is higher and uh, you know it's harder for me to stay hydrated and it's definitely harder for me to stay fueled with enough calories to support that. So uh, you know everything has just become exaggerated. So I have to just take that into account and just have to push myself hard, but uh, you know, with correct diligence behind it in order to uh, fulfill this. Absolutely. See, we know you're taking part in the Ironman competitions and you class yourself as a hybrid athlete, which I love that terminology, definitely. Tell us what that means and the kind of mindset you need for that because it's kind of a, a different thing, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I believe a hybrid athlete is uh, a person that is kind of versatile in their approach and they can, you know, compete in multiples of sports. And uh, obviously, a lot of bodybuilders are considered more as ornaments than anything else. Yeah. Anything else, where you know they will show themselves, but ex, you know that's ex, that's very external. I don't know if that's internally healthy. Always, sometimes it is, but a lot of people have a lot of insecurities, a lot of pressure, and uh, you know some people diet the wrong way. You know whether they're you know completely depleting themselves of carbs and not taking in enough fibers and they're definitely not eating enough fruits or antioxidants and they're obviously taking, you know, putting their bodies through a lot of cortisol stress and uh, free radical damage, but they're very restricted in what they're eating and then to put on size, a lot of people think, well, I've just got to make sure I don't utilize any calories now, I've just got to put myself down and put my feet up and not move and not do any cardio. And I've never come from that train of thought. I've always performed cardio at least once a day, sometimes twice a day, year-round. Even though I may not be in shape all year-round, I just find it's a better way of recovery in order to put on muscle. And obviously it's good for your heart and lungs. You know, that is the muscle that's most important. And we want to continue to get blood flow to our brain to give us more focus, to make us feel better, to be potentially smarter. I'm yet to experience that. <laughs> and... Um, and then, uh, um, you know, with the versatility of performing something like an Ironman, I believe uh, yeah. that, that it, it's, it's definitely more fulfilling to your life. Knowing that you are being as healthy as you possibly can, you're eating all the foods and the fuels from good, possibly organic structure or fermented yeah. foods or patented ingredients, knowing that you are fueling your internal health and our life life. Because a lot of people just focus on the carcass and the vessel and not focus on the lifeline that we've been given. And I feel that we shouldn't just be a mansion put up here. We should be able to move and be mobile in, you know, uh, within our residency. And uh, being versatile and being able to complete an Ironman or complete a Spartan race or you know, a tough mudder or a marathon 
uh, whilst being a bodybuilder, I think is, is the perfect because bodybuilding does provide so many health benefits if done correctly. But obviously, moving and putting yourself through these disciplines of uh, cardio intensity, aerobic and anaerobic activity, uh, brings together the perfect hybrid athlete, as I like to call it. And that's what I hope to do with this very video series, is open the doors of opportunities for other people. Like, wouldn't it be fantastic if there was another sport based from something like this, where somebody would have to compete in a mountain or a triathlon, and within the same two months or whatever, compete in a bodybuilding show, and you have a point as the ultimate hybrid athlete. Do you think that's um, Chris Gethin's next project? Creating your own event, creating your own hybrid athlete discipline? I'll have to surround myself with some very smart people to get that done. I don't know if I can get it done myself. <laughs> that would be so cool to do, though. Just, uh, yeah, just yeah, to yeah. people's horizons. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. Really, you know, we want to you know, debunk a lot of the myths out there that you know, bodybuilders cannot be functional and bodybuilders shouldn't do these, uh, these other sports because it's going to lead to muscle wastage, which is a lot of bullshit, you know. If, of course, if we eat like a triathlete or we eat like a runner and supplement like a runner and train like one, well, yeah, you're going to look like one, but we're actually supplementing and training and eating like a bodybuilder, yeah. but we're also training like a triathlete. So a lot of triathletes will ask, well, why are you taking protein with you on the bike? Why have you got BCAAs? Why have you got glutamine? You know, why are you taking in all this protein? And because I don't want to look like that. I have all the respect and I know it is very efficient because you know, I have people passing me who are like 110 pound females, maybe 100 pound, and they're going like the clappers because they're very efficient with having very little muscle that requires less oxygen utilization and definitely less uh, pump and less lactic acid buildup. But I'm okay being mediocre. I want, you know, as long as I can be a mediocre finisher, because as long as I finish an Ironman, then that's me winning, you know. So I'm good with that. I just want to be physical. Well, the thing is, the competition is against you. It's not against anyone else. It's about you being the best you were last time or whatever. You know, that that's what it's about, isn't it? Well, that's definitely correct. And you, and you have to make sure that you're absolutely at peace with that. Yeah. Uh, because it can be tough, because, you know, uh, you know, in, in this Ironman, I was passed by so many people when it came to an incline, when it came to a hill, I was passed by a lot of people, but I know that I am utilizing an extra six watts of power per kilogram, even on as little as a 2% slope. So I have to be okay and do whatever I can on the flats or the decline to, you know, improve my time there. So you've got the Ironman. What's your next challenge after that going to be, or is it just the Iron Man at the moment? That's all you're focused on. Uh, I, I am thinking uh, it could possibly be a Spartan uh, race, uh, but I don't know whether it'll be a Spartan race or a death race after this. Oh One or the other. So a death race is uh, more like a 48-hour sort of uh, race where you know you have different sort of strategies and games and uh, double what you call them like kind of puzzles to fix out into the wilderness and you've that. just got yourself in a backpack uh, and that's pretty much it and you know I, I know a couple of people that compete in these and see the state on like their feet after an event I know it's going to be tough but you get a skull as a trophy and I want that skull that yes, is cool. awesome <laughs> that is very cool I love that excellent fantastic um we want to know um how we can follow your progress watching this a year down the line obviously you know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be inspired by you so where can they see all of your progress with your training around the Ironman is it all on bodybuilding.com or where do they go yes yeah it is all on bodybuilding.com so there's the Man of Iron video series that is being uploaded every week weekly episodes but they show the entire you know the, the seven days of the week in clips and you know some people watch it for entertainment purposes however the program is on there as well my supplement my training my nutritional uh, regime week by week so should people want to uh, follow it and uh, pursue it themselves they can but they don't have to just do 
all of it. If somebody wants to just follow the muscle building aspect of it, then follow my weights workout and don't do the other disciplines. So it's something that we're trying to feed there for you know everybody. And of course, I put updates on my Instagram every now and again. You know, like my workouts from this morning will be up on Insta Stories in a couple of hours' time, so people can follow uh, you know some little clips and snippets there too. Excellent. Oh no, I'm I'm just doing the weight side of your program. Is you know Barry sort of taking me through bits and pieces, but yeah. So it's nice you've got that that diversity there, definitely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, exactly, well, something different. Specifically, like you said, there's a lot of unilateral movements in there. You know, I'm getting a lot of hate from people because I'm doing like Bosu ball stuff, but it has helped me no end uh, because you know I everybody's unique. I've uh, had you know I've torn the tendons in my ankles probably seven or eight times, I got very skinny ankles, so that was something that I had to address, and obviously my core is very weak, uh, incomplete for something like this, so uh, there's a lot of techniques within it that does help work various areas that you wouldn't generally always work, so it'll, it'll help you become more of a complete trainer. Definitely, trainer. I mean, you know, for me, I do a lot of martial arts, so for me, that kind of movement is fantastic, and I feel we should be you know, training on that kind of plane with the booster boy, with, with our balance, you know, training our, you know, tiny stabilizer muscles. So for me, it's just brilliant. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of things. And also, I can get hold of um, your website as well. What's your website? Is that just chrisgethin.com? Yeah, so I've got a couple of web websites out there. Uh, but yeah, there's cagedmuscle.com, www.cagedmuscle, K A G E D, muscle.com. So, I do put out a couple of newsletters every week, so I do write uh, various programs, various motivational aspects, sometimes with recipes, but of course I don't charge for any of these videos on my newsletters. I do put articles up and videos up on Cage Muscle uh, weekly as well. I've got my YouTube channels, but if people want uh, you know, some other stuff from me, whether it's you know, access to myself or you know, DTP, you know, training principle and my accessories and my books and that's all on chrisgeffin.com as well. Cool. Excellent, okay. fantastic. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us but before you go, we always have to do the quick fire round which we do at the end of all of our little podcasts, okay? So these are not thinking too much about it, just going with it. Are you ready? Because this is probably going to be the most important thing you've ever done in your whole <laughs> life. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm holding on to this table for dear life. Right. Okay. Number one is your most inspirational quote. Um, knowledge without mileage is bullshit. Like it. Like it. Be my, my What's your favourite destination you've been to, and why? Favourite destination that I've already been to, I'd say, would be uh, I like Thailand and you know Koh Samui the island there specifically. I just thought it was very, the, the hospitality there was unbelievable. And it's not as if people were working for tips or anything like that. But I felt like, you know, you're always gaining a smile from people. So you're always wanting to give a smile back and it just uplifts you. And uh, I absolutely love the fruit there. There's fruits that I've never seen before anywhere else. And yeah, it's just a, a color, eye and taste explosion. So I, I always look forward to uh, visiting Thailand, and that would be right. Fantastic. Cool, cool. Um, Chris, what do you want to be known for? Uh, I'd want to be known for that the, the person that really didn't come from an educated background, you know, not being very smart, but willing to, you know, outwork uh, myself all the time. You know, when I read a book, sometimes I have to read a page like five times for me to get it in my head. But I will read it the five times. I'm not as smart as a person that can read a page and continue and go through the book in a week. It may take me four weeks, but I'll be persistent until I get it in. You know, and that's not on everything. Tell me to figure something out on a computer, that's not going to happen. You know, you ask me to run the mouse up the screen, I'll probably grab hold of the mouse. And <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Excellent. What's your favorite movie and why? Favorite movie? If you get uh, time to watch a movie, uh, that is. Uh, I, tell, I like Pulp Fiction. You know that always stuck with me. You know, and um, I'd say the way that it was put together, how Quentin Tarantino had uh, put together the clips of the movie and how the 
ending was that the beginning was the first of its kind and yeah. how that it was mm -hmm. done. And he had brought actors out of the out of the woodwork who had never had work for so many years, yeah. uh, such as John Travolta. He was doing very very bad movies, but he relaunched his career and obviously other people's careers, like you know, like Bruce Willis, Samuel L. Jackson, and uh, he did an amazing job. Tim Roth, it was great. I loved it. Oh, excellent! No, I love that one as well. So, and your favourite song of all time, and why? Favorite song of all time. God, that is so hard because there's so many bands that I put on a level playing field and musicians that I put on a uh, level playing field. But I'd probably say it would be Epic by Faith No More. Not, no Tom Jones, no? no sorry, <laughs> Midlife Crisis. I got that wrong. Midlife Crisis by Faith No More. Well, Tom Jones, he's definitely the man. <laughs> he's up there, but you know, he doesn't rub my roof after the same <laughs> I love it. So what's your first childhood memory? First childhood memory was playing, uh, is my first day of primary school, and I was playing in the sand pit, and my mother had taken me to school, and then I turned around, and my mum wasn't there, and I asked the teacher then, Mrs. Bridgman, where my mum was, got, where my mum was, she said, she's just gone over the bridge to get some shopping, she'll be back in a minute, and she, she never came back. Not that day, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Not that day. Uh, that would be my memory because I thought I, I, I was in a bit of a panic. I was with my mum. These Tonka trucks are fun for about 30 minutes, but that's it. Oh, oh my god. Oh, wow. Well, if you've got any deep scarring, we can help you with the hypnosis stuff, so it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, right, okay, this one. What question have you never been asked, but you've always wanted to be asked it? There hasn't been one. <laughs> I hate to be boring with this. Um, you know, I get lot, asked a lot of questions. I have to admit, I'm not good up close. I enjoy putting out my videos. I enjoy putting out my books. I'm at an expo that people would want to meet me. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not very good up close. I don't feel good with accolades and, uh, you, know, those, you know, the questions in regards to fitness and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I'm coming up short with that one. No, but, uh, cool. I think that's quite insightful. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Last question, who's your biggest inspiration and why? My biggest inspiration, if I'm putting it down to one person, is uh, Henry Rollins. Henry Rollins is uh, the former singer of Black Flag and the Rollins Band. And uh, he's put out many books. He's an actor. He's a spoken word artist. He has a column in LA Weekly. Uh, the guy is an absolute workhorse. And like, if he goes on tour, generally... He will go on tour for a year and they will be like two days off throughout that year. And he's probably 55 years old now. So he is the absolute opposite of what we would regard as the millennial. And I like that. He keeps it real. He works hard. He hits it hard in the gym. And uh, he, again, from the same sort of background, he's not educated. But he, and he understands that. He acknowledges that. But he will always push for work. And he never has an excuse. He would be typing on this uh, keyboard right now, and he has done, with uh, his broken left arm. And he'll go to the doctor maybe five weeks later to see why it still isn't working. And I just like the mentality that he doesn't complain, he doesn't seek sympathy, because I believe sympathy weakens us. You know, when we're seeking it, you know, what's it going to do? It's not going to do anything except turn you yellow and make your spine sag. Mm. So I really like that from Henry, and I read all of his books. He just came out with another one called The Chopping Block Part 3, as of two weeks ago, and you know, I'm loving it. I love his content. Oh, that's really fantastic. Awesome. I love to check him out. I met him a couple of times. I met, saw him first in 1992 at Reading Music Festival. Blew me away there. And then I met him last year, and we've been in contact. And uh, this was an amazing moment for me when I uh, met with, when I waited around for him half day. He looked at me and said, hey, you're Chris. He recognized me, and I, I will never forget that. And when I got some stuff from him signed, it was like five minutes later, as I'm putting the stuff in my bag, I realized, like, I'm shaking. And I've never experienced that before in my life. So I would say that would be the reason why... He's uh, my number one inspiration. That's pretty Brilliant awesome. Stuff. I'll have to check him yeah. out. But before we leave this and we wrap this up, what being the uh, fitness expert and the guru, whatever the word, the terminology you want to call yourself, 
What one bit of advice would you give our listeners today to help them lead a healthy, wealthy, and sort of lifestyle? What one bit of advice would you give these guys? It's going to come from one of my quotes again, and that's uh, to control your environment and not be controlled by it. Because there are you know, more excuses, just like there are more social platforms coming up every day. And uh, people fall for it all the time. They convince themselves of their excuse of why they can't do something. And that's because they're being controlled by their environments, whether that be because I can't get the lucky break. Um, I can't get my meals in because I'm traveling. I don't have the time. And it's all bullshit that they feed themselves all the time. And I hate it. And people relinquish to it all the time. And you just have to stick with a plan and come up with it with consistency. And don't focus on, this is what I'm trying to accomplish in three weeks' time. Now focus what you're trying to accomplish today. Once you get through the today, just like a prisoner, scratch it off on your wall and then get through the second day. And three weeks will lead itself to it. Mm-hmm. Not focusing on two months' time. I need to make sure I get through today and that will lead me to being successful over that line to be called an Ironman. Love that. That's Fantastic bit of advice. Thank you so much, Chris. Look, we are so grateful for you joining us today and chatting to us because we know you're a busy guy. So thank you so much. Yeah, really appreciate it. It's my absolute pleasure. It's good to connect again, Laura. It's been a long time. I know. So knowing you guys are doing this podcast, and I'm obviously a little bit weary about some podcasts. So I listened to some of your episodes. Awesome, they're very interesting and they're good questions and good preparation. So I'm honored to be on the platform. Thank you. No, thank and you. And if so we can much. do anything for you to return the favor, uh, we'd be more than happy to. You could send me some black pudding over for I really miss some black pudding and uh, some Yorkshire puddings too. I'd be that'd be no great. problem. I think that when I say that. Email me your address and I'll send some over. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thanks so much, Chris. It's been great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers.